Hey, before we get started here, I just want to say that we need to stop being so divisive in this country. All right. People can have a difference of opinion without being racist, without being, you know, self-loathing black man, without being whatever you want to put on it. Okay. You have to take the facts that you're presented with and come up with the best course of action. All right. So there's a, not a lot of good faith effort right now coming from the quote unquote political left and political right to work with each other. All right. I'm in the military and we have to come up with plans to execute operations. Now, everybody doesn't always have the same plan to execute the operation. All right. But we all have the same facts, but we all have the same goal. We all realize that. Okay. So one thing that is not being done in good faith right now in the world, especially in the U S is that people assume your intentions when you give them your course of action, right? So what I'm about to say right now has nothing to do with my intentions being different than anyone else's. I think that what I'm about to talk about is something that will improve the black community. Okay. I think it's the best course of action. So if you assume that somebody's course of action is incorrect and leads to a different place, but you don't acknowledge that they think that course of action is leading to the place that you also want to be. It leads to a lot of division. So anyways, with all that said, let's get into this video. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another video. Today is a little bit more serious of a tone. Today is a little bit more of a issue that I really see as uh, something that needs addressing with the black community. And um, it starts from within. So I've got a lot of stuff prepared for you guys today. And I'm not doing my little Market Sundays video because this one I think is more important right now. So I wanted to talk to you guys about what I'm seeing out there uh, based on some stories, some news, and just give you guys my perspective. If you guys could give this a like for putting all this together and sharing my thoughts on this, you guys seem to appreciate my thoughts on these current events and putting it in an economic lens. I always say people that don't understand economics, you don't understand how the world turns. Uh, it's very hard to put these events in perspective. So you follow the dollars and you will find the answers. But anyways, three things that I wanted to address today based on the DMX, Chris Hogan, and Kevin Durant stories. I think that they all have three lessons to teach the black community. And that is fatherhood, ownership, and the importance of strong black mentors. So we're going to talk about all three of those today. Strap up your seat belts. Let's get into the first story. So DMX opens up about the origins of his crack addiction. So this is a little bit older. If you guys don't know out there, DMX is <clears throat> struggling right now. I believe he's in the hospital. He just OD'd. Um, we've got a picture of him performing there. Um, anybody in the community has probably listened to his music, enjoyed it. But I wanted to highlight a couple things about this. So down here, what I've got highlighted is he went to reveal his journey about, this is an interview with Talib Kweli. His journey with drug abuse started at just 14 years old when his mentor, that's a key word, mentor, gave him a crack lace blunt without telling him it, what he smoked. He passed the blunt around and I hit the blunt, he said. He explained, misty eyed, I never felt like this before. It effed me up. I later found out it was the blunt was laced with crack. Why would you do that to a child? He was like 30 and he knew I looked up to him. Why would you do that to someone who looks up to you? So that's kind of underscores what we're going to get into today. All right. That was his mentor. He was out in the streets. You know, a lot of us are out in the streets um, as a community because we don't have that that mentor in the home. Let's go back into the presentation here. So let's get into what happened with these two. And we're going to tie all of this together. So Kevin Durant got caught harassing Michael Report, Rapport, however you say it, in tweets, which I'll briefly summarize. So basically, if we look at these, he basically says a couple homophobic slurs. You know, we're not here to say, oh, Kevin Durant said bad words. He basically threatens the guy a little bit and um, he gets in trouble. Right. So the point the the point being he gets in trouble. All right. And this guy is supposedly a Trump supporter and he's angry about that. So he starts to threaten the guy and all these other things. Kevin Durant has been wild in the DMs. In the past, but anyways, moving on. Basically, what happened? What happened is Hogan, he signed a contract and Dave Ramsey fired him on a whim when he was found to be cheating with his spouse. Okay, he was found to be cheating with his spouse 
and he was fired after they found out that he was cheating with his spouse but he wasn't fired immediately he was fired after i think about a year what they let it slide kd signed a contract right so he's in an employee employer relationship his money was taken fifty thousand dollar fine and he was slapped on the wrist all right he's basically told what to do we'll get into a little bit more of nba players being told what to do and what to say later in the video in dmx his mentor began him on smoking crack an addictive substance so as we said earlier i think that the solutions to all of these problems are ownership black fatherhood and strong black mentors and we're going to get into that later the worst solutions of who to go to with our problems are the nba which claims to support black lives matter but actually answers to china which a side note on that the who also answers to china blm who sneakily removed in their what we stand for dismantling the western nuclear family so i'm going to show you guys some clips really quick first one is going to be of the nba and china I'm just going to show you guys a series of clips that underscores what exactly is going on with the nba in china and the next one is going to be the fact that the who which is who we are trusting with our health information they answer directly to china and they will not talk about taiwan they won't even acknowledge the existence of taiwan this is Shaq on the Great Wall of China. Here's Michael Jordan, Pau Gasol, Steph Curry. There are a lot of these. For years, the NBA has been sending teams to China, where more people watch NBA games than in the United States. The purpose is to play basketball, meet Chinese fans, and have players like Rip Hamilton spread a clear message. The NBA has worked hard to build a successful business in China, but then they almost lost it all because of a single tweet. The Fortune 500 companies are controlling the American foreign policy in China. This is wrong, it's gotta stop. President Clinton, we are asking you to take a courageous position but Clinton insisted that doing business with China would have a positive impact on their human rights platform. The question is not whether we approve or disapprove of China's practices. The question is, what's the smartest thing to do to improve these practices? Nearly 500 million people watched NBA games last year using Tencent, China's largest streaming platform. That's more than the entire population of the United States. In 2019, Tencent and the NBA signed a deal worth one and a half billion dollars, almost three times what it was worth five years ago. Then, seven words threatened everything. Um, you know, you know, we love China. We love, you know, playing there. The NBA commissioner stood behind Mori at a press conference. The long-held values of the NBA are to support freedom of expression. And in this case, Daryl Morey, as the general manager of the Houston Rockets, enjoys that right. But the league undercut their message when journalists were stopped from asking about the incident afterwards. I just wonder after the events of this week and the fallout we've seen, whether you would both feel differently about speaking out in that way in future. Um, excuse me, we can't ask about questions only. Any other questions? Foreign businesses in China have long recognized that there are red lines that must not be crossed. And traditionally, those have been the three T's, Taiwan, Tibet, Tiananmen. Senior WHO official has raised hackles in Taiwan by appearing to dodge questions about Taiwan's exclusion from the World Health Body. During an interview via video chat with a Hong Kong media outlet, Bruce Isleward, a Canadian epidemiologist, remained silent for about 10 seconds when asked if the WHO should reconsider Taiwan's membership. After their video hookup appeared to be disconnected, the interviewer called him back. This time, Isleward declared that if he had contracted the coronavirus, he would want to be treated in China. WHO considered Taiwan's membership. Hello? We, 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 I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I couldn't hear your question. Okay, at yeah, all. Let, me, let, let, me, let me repeat the question. No, so. that's okay. Let, let's move to another one then. When Islewood was asked about Taiwan, he stalled for close to 10 seconds and avoided a reporter's question, 
But the reporter persisted. I'm actually curious on talking about Taiwan as well, on Taiwan's case. We decided to give Dr. Alward another call to follow up. And I just want to see if you can comment a bit on how Taiwan has done so far in terms of containing the virus. Well, we've, we've already talked about China. Iowood is an assistant director general at the WHO and is a Canadian-trained epidemiologist. Ever since the pandemic broke out, he has constantly sung China's praises. I left um, inspired and with mm. a deep admiration for, uh, you know, the common Chinese people uh, that, that I worked with. If I had COVID-19, I want to be treated in, in China. Lin Shijia, the CEO of the Foundation of Medical Professionals Alliance, lamented that the WHO has been deeply poisoned by Chinese influence. He said he believed that once the pandemic was over, each nation would seriously consider how to reform these kinds of international organisations that had been heavily infiltrated by China. So guys, that's what communism looks like. That's what it looks like. The NBA players looking shocked, silenced. The Taiwanese interviewer looking completely dumbfounded, right? The guy, Caucasian guy, right, just looking at her soullessly empty expression nothing nothing there nothing doing that's what government control looks like it looks like fear it looks like this guy will say anything that he's told to say All right that's the opposite of free speech okay so i hope that gives you guys some perspective there the nba essentially answers to china and the WHO also answers to China. And a lot of people out there are ready to say, you know, this is a failing of capitalism, but this is actually what happens when you have a big, strong government that meets with capitalism, right? The big, strong government wields capitalism as a weapon, okay? So the answer is not necessarily to make the government bigger, stronger, have more power, because we see what happens when a very large government meets a very large and rich corporation. All right, so let's talk about ownership. So if we took all of Kevin Durant's salaries, added them up, and then taxed them at a 39% rate, we would end up with $268 million after tax. Even if he lived off of 5% of what he made in that time, and this is after tax, he would still be able to live off of $838,000 per year. If you assume a 12% return, he would have $681 million at the end of 16 years, or in other words, that's how long it's going to take for him to get from when he got into the NBA to 2023, which is the end of his current contract. So he'd be worth $681 million. $681 million buys you 25% of the team that he plays for, okay? you think that he would be getting a slap on the wrist if he owned 25% of the team? Probably not. Maybe from the commissioner, but probably not. All right, so imagine he picks up another four-year contract for about the same amount. So that gives him a 20-year career. He retires at age 39. He would have $1.14 billion, which buys you 43% of the team at the current value. Obviously, the value would have gone up by then, so we can assume he would own about 35% of the team. So essentially, by the time he's, let's say, 50, he could own the Brooklyn Nets, okay? And that's because if you're thinking like an owner, you would own that team. You wouldn't be getting fined by that team. You would own that team. All that said, Kevin Durant is, seems to be doing just fine. I think he has about $170 million net worth, which is about $170 million more than I have. But I just wanted to underscore that mindset. Now, you might be asking yourself, is this possible? Yes, actually, it is possible. So what we have down here are the returns of the NASDAQ. And if we look at the tech-heavy sector of the NASDAQ, 12.31% is what it has returned over the past 15 years, or since 2006, right? And he was drafted in 2007. So if you would have thrown it into the tech-heavy NASDAQ, or being that he is Kevin Durant and the, that he makes so much money, he could probably find some type of fund, something that's outperforming, some asset class that's outperforming, and he could have put his money into that. So I'm not sitting here trying to bash anybody because Kevin Durant's done very well with his money from what I can see. 
170 million dollar net worth is not anything to scoff at all right so next thing we're going to talk about is black fatherhood and the importance of it so we've got some statistics to go through and we also have this is from wtf happened in 1971 if you guys haven't seen the wtf happened in 1971 video make sure you go check that out there's a lot of things that happened after we broke from the gold standard after the government started printing a bunch of money so Check this out. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes, 90% of all runaway children, 85% of children who showed behavior disorders, 80% of rapists with anger problems, 71% of high school dropouts, 75% of adolescent patients in chemical abuse centers, 85% of all youths in prison. All of those come from fatherless homes. And look at what happened as the government started to take over more and more of the economy. So if we think that the government is the answer, then we're, we're just ignoring some very inconvenient facts. Next slide. Okay, so fatherhood, once again, 40% chance of growing up in poverty if you're born into a single parent home, 4% chance if you are born into a married home. Children of single mothers are 14 times more likely to suffer abuse, 33 times more likely than that of a married couple if the man is not the father of the child, okay? And like we said, once again, once the government started to print more money and take over more of the economy, AKA we become more socialistic, which I'm gonna have a little bit more on a video on that tomorrow, we see that these numbers are going up. Okay, and the last one I wanted to go through is strong black mentors. So DMX, like we said, he got hooked on this by his mentor and my heart goes out to him. I don't wanna make light of any situations because this stuff actually means a lot to me. That's why I want to talk about it. And that's why I like to give the best faith effort that I can that I think is going to improve the most lives out there that are plagued by these terrible, terrible outcomes. So these are some strong black mentors that I follow. And before I get into these mentors, I just want to say that there's a good old saying about having mentors and people that you look up to. They say having a mentor or having a hero is like eating fish. You eat the fish and you throw away the bones, okay? So do I agree with everything that every single person on this list says? Absolutely not. But I do think that these are some strong black mentors. If you believe everything that anyone says and you wholeheartedly agree with it, you are not someone who thinks for themselves. I'll say it like that. So anyways, these guys, Thomas Sowell, Earn Your Leisure, and Ian Dunlop over there. They do Market Mondays. It's a beautiful program. If people had to tune into that, that would absolutely improve the black community. Eric Thomas. If you guys don't know Eric Thomas, you must be living under a rock. The Black Hokage. This one, you guys may not all know who he is. He's actually a gaming streamer, but he's a very mature individual, very smart guy. And lastly, Denzel Washington. And that guy can speak. That guy can act, and that guy can speak. So... I'd like him to close out the video with a relevant message about what we've been talking about, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Black people in particular, do you think that we can truly make change as things are right now? Well, it starts in the home. You know, if the father's not in the home, the boy will find the father in the streets. Yeah, I saw it in my generation and every generation before me and, and everyone since. It starts in the home. You know, if the streets raise you, then the judge becomes your mother and, you know, and prison becomes your home. I want to just ask you, though, about the issue of race relations, because the film touches upon that. Uh, right now, under President Obama, over the last eight years, in your mind, has race, have race relations improved under his leadership? I, you know, race relationships have to do with race relationships. You're white or whatever you are, I'm black or whatever I am. We're standing here talking now. That's how we get things done. You can't legislate love. The President of the United States can't legislate us into liking each other. We have to step forward and ask questions about each other and engage. There's no law that says, oh, because I'm President, you all got to get along now. So it's up to us. It was something I read where you talked about your people from Mount Vernon saying that you know, like they've done like 40 years in a penitentiary together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and, you know, incarceration rates in America has been a problem, especially as, as opposed to minorities. And Roman delves into this, the, the issues around the, the legal system. Do you think we've made any headway? In the I think it's more important to make headway in our own house. By the time the system comes into play, the damage is done. They're not locking up seven year olds. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I was in Chicago couple of three, four weeks ago. 
and we saw these little kids on bikes with masks on the side of their head, like five or six of them. And the driver said, yeah, they're little yummies. I said, who? He said, little, little yummies. Look up, Google little yummy. Mm. Little yummy was an 11 year old murderer. Wow. And you look at his picture, you'll see the headshot of him, and he's like this. And he got murdered at 11 by a 14 year old. Wow. Who's doing life now, a 16 year old. That makes no sense. You, you blame the system? Where was his father? It yeah. starts in the house. It starts in the home. And yeah, well, well, my father got locked up. Well, where was his father? Yeah.